Hey friend, welcome to my channel Karina Lude where we deep dive and break down the most iconic stars in history. If you're not yet subscribed, please be sure to do so and turn your notifications on so you never miss an upload. Now let's get into this video. Today we are talking about the iconic Veronica Lake. In Hollywood, it's rare for a starlet to become famous in a short amount of time at that. And Veronica Lake was one of the few who did. This Gun for Hire was one of Lake's first movies. It was a classic noir movie about murder and blackmail. And Lake played a femme fatale in it. People liked the movie and both audiences and critics liked it a lot. Lake's beauty and unique style really stood out. She became Hollywood's new it girl almost as soon as the movie came out. Who Framed Roger Rabbit used Lake as a model for the animated character Jessica Rabbit, specifically for her hair. Did you guys also know that Aaliyah, yes, the iconic Aaliyah, was also inspired by Veronica Lake and her hair? She is most known for walking away from it all and leaving Hollywood behind to become a waitress at the peak of her fame. And this is what she had to say. I had to get out, the star wrote. I was never psychologically meant to be a picture star. People felt very sorry for me, but I really enjoyed the job, speaking about being a waitress. I seem to have found peace. Spare me the high pressure of success. I've been there, end quote. We're gonna get into her childhood and just the sad, very, very sad ending of her life. And this is a prime example of how Hollywood will chew you up and spit you out. And it really is not forever. Hollywood is no diamond at all. It is not forever. So let's get into her childhood. Veronica Lake was actually born with the name Constance Frances Marie Okelman. She was born on November 14th, 1922 in the borough of Brooklyn in New York City. Veronica Lake's childhood was rough. Her German and Irish dad worked at an oil tank and didn't come home very often. In 1932, her father died at work by accident. At the time, Lake was 10 years old and within a year, her Irish mother got married again to a newspaper illustrator. But when Veronica Lake was two, her mother was told she had to Closest. So that her mother could get treatment, the family had to move from Manhattan to Saranac Lake, New York. Life wasn't easy for Veronica Lake. A mental health diagnosis she got when she was young was one reason why she had problems from the start and a rough personal life. Lake was told as a child that she had schizophrenia. Lake will deal with the illness for the rest of her life and throughout her career. She had things like auditory hallucinations, so she would hear things, paranoia, confused thinking, and bad relationships with other people. Veronica Lake went to St. Bernard School in Saranac Lake, New York, where the family was based. She was later sent to a Catholic all-girls boarding school in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, where she was eventually expelled. When her stepfather got sick, her family moved to Miami, Florida. Lake went to Miami High School where everyone knew how pretty she was. She was the talk of the town. After graduating from high school, Lake said she enrolled at McGill University and studied pre-med for a year with the goal of becoming a surgeon. Although Veronica Lake later rejected the rumors, it had already appeared in several press biographies. Veronica later apologized to McGill's president who upon hearing about Lake's tendencies towards storytelling or dramatizing the truth, simply laughed it off. And a lot of these starlets back in the 1940s especially always used to come up with these creative stories about their lives that kind of made them more attractive to the people. So you'd have like a starlet who was born rich actually and to wealth and prestige she would kind of make up the story that she came from a farm <laughs> and that she came without any money and she went through this struggle or had some kind of abuse in the home or something like that they would create those as well as some would create more interesting lives like oh i went to medical school i was supposed to be a lawyer they still do that today you know the sob story it's kind of like the American Idol era where everyone the performers all had this sob story with the sad music and get people to really fall in love with them and root for them. So Veronica Lake was accused of doing that a lot in her early stardom but they didn't really have much say so over their image. It was the picture companies um, that they were assigned to that really created the persona for them or even changed their names and we're gonna see that they would change their whole identities. So she didn't really have much say so but the backlash would typically fall on her you know for that with a lot of these starlets most of the things that we do hear about them some of them can be true and some of them can be false uh, in regards to their childhood because we really won't know you know now as far as her career so her mother was able to see how beautiful her daughter was and wanted to cash in on her looks back then there was no better way to do so than to become an actress her mother quickly became a stage mom and pushed heavy for her daughter to break into Hollywood even though Veronica herself said it was not what she wanted to do 
So her family relocated to Beverly Hills, California that year, and Lake attended the Bliss Hayden School of Acting, MGM's acting farm, while she was under contract with the company. Assistant director Fred Wilcox took notice of Lake and filmed her performing an excerpt from a play to show to an agent. Producer Arthur Hornblow Jr. was looking for a new girl to play a nightclub singer, so the agent took a look at it and recommended her to Hornblow. Lake, only in her teens at the time, would become famous thanks to this role. The actress's name was changed by Hornblow to Veronica Lake. Her name comes from his description of her eyes, which he said were calm and clear like a blue lake. So that wasn't even her real name. Even though Hornblow came up with a name that made Lake a star, Lake herself hated it for a very sad reason. Her mother's real name was Veronica and Lake wanted nothing more than to be free of her overbearing mother. And she said, I just sat down and cried when she found out that was her stage name, but it was too late for her to say anything. It was during the filming of I Wanted Wings that Lake developed her signature look. Lake's long blonde hair accidentally fell over her right eye during a take and created a peekaboo effect. She said, I was playing a sympathetic drunk. I had my arm on a table, it slipped in my hair. It was always baby fine and had this natural break fell over my face. It became my trademark and purely by accident, she recalled. I Wanted Wings was a big hit. The hairstyle became Lake's trademark and was widely copied by women. Veronica Lake didn't think much of her acting skills and most people didn't think she was technically talented either. Because of her charm and good looks, she was chosen. Lake once said about her acting skills, you could put all the talent I had in your left eye and not have your vision get worse, end quote. Lake was held as the find of 1941 before the release of the film. Although this was encouraging, Lake still believed that becoming a surgeon was her best long-term Term option saying only the seasoned veterans stick around for a while when I reach my goal I don't want to linger I intend to resume my medical education she remarked Lake was a complicated person who gained a reputation for being difficult to work with. Eddie Bracken, who co-starred with Lake in the film Star Spangled Rhythm and in which Lake performed a musical number, was quoted as saying, she was known as the bitch and she deserved the title. Nonetheless, Lake and McCree collaborated on another film, Ramrod. The name Moronica Lake was used to cast her in the role of the Blue Dahlia in Raymond Chandler's 1946, because they wanted to call her a moron and airhead. That's pretty harsh, right? So the movie I Married a Witch, also from 1942 and produced by Sturges and directed by Renee Claire, would have reunited Lake with McCree, but McCree reportedly said, life's too short for two films with Veronica Lake, end quote. And so they never worked together again. A holdup in production allowed Lake to replace Patricia Morrison in The Glass Key, reuniting Ladd with the actress he had last worked with in The Big Sleep. I Married a Witch, which featured Frederick March as the male lead, was a commercial success in the same vein as The Glass Key. Lake was a very gifted girl, but she didn't believe she was gifted. And as I Married a Witch director Renee Claire put it, Veronica Lake really didn't believe in herself like she should have had. During World War II, Lake changed her signature pickaboo hairstyle at the government's request. The government wanted to get women working in factories that made things for the war to wear hairstyles that were more practical and safer. Even though the change made it less likely for women to get hurt when their hair got caught in machines, it may have hurt Lake's career. During World War II, she was a popular pinup girl for soldiers and she went all over the United States to sell war bonds and raise money. But once she changed her hairstyle, I guess we would just didn't like the appeal as much. The hairstyle really gave her a mysterious appeal and they weren't really rocking with it. Comment below if you know any celebrities who had a signature trademark hair and when they change it, it kind of, mm, they lost their appeal a little bit. This really happened to her, I can't believe it. But that's how shallow the industry was at that time and consumers were as well. So her movie started flopping simply because she changed her hair, guys. Now let's talk about her marriages. When Lake was just 18, she married John S. Dettiel, an art director. So she had a daughter, Elaine, born in 1941, and Anthony, a son, born in 1952. And Lake's son was reportedly born prematurely because the actress tripped over a lightning cable on set on July 15, 1943, Anthony passed away. Lake and the Teal split up in August of 1943 and finalized their divorce a few months later. Lake married movie director Andre Detoff in 1944. They had a son, Andre Anthony Michael III, and a daughter, Diana, who was born in October 1948. Lake's mother sued her for child support a few days before her daughter, Diana, was born. Lake and Detoff filed for bankruptcy that same year. After Detoff bought an airplane, Lake got her license to fly it in 1946. The IRS later 
overseas their home for unpaid taxes. Later, when she was leaving him, she flew by herself from Los Angeles to New York, and in 1952, Lake and Detoth split up. In September 1955, she married songwriter Joseph Allen McCarthy. They were divorced in 1959, and in 1969, she revealed that she rarely saw her children. After her third divorce, Lake moved around from cheap hotel to cheap hotel in New York City. She was arrested several times for being drunk in public and acting erratically, and in 1962, a reporter from the New York Post found her working as a waitress in the cocktail lounge of the all-women Martha Washington Hotel in Manhattan. She was using the name Connie de Toth at work and Lake said that one reason she took the job was I like people I enjoy talking to them people thought Lake was poor because of the reporters widely shared story after the story came out Lake's fans sent her money which she returned with pride Lake denied vehemently that she was poor and said it is as if people were trying to make me look like I was in bad shape I was not I was renting a place for 190 a month, which is equivalent to like 1600 in today's time, which is a long way from being broke, she said. Some people became interested in Lake again because of the story, and she went on to do some TV and stage work, including a revival of the musical Best Foot Forward of Broadway in 1963. In 1966, she was a TV hostess in Baltimore, Maryland for a short time. She also had a small role in the movie Footsteps in the Snow, which was mostly ignored. She also kept playing parts on the stage. She went to the Bahamas to see a friend in Freeport, but she ended up staying there for a few years. Veronica, the autobiography of Veronica Lake, Lake's memoirs, were published in the UK in 1969 and in the US the following year. Lake opens up about her alcoholic past, the shortcomings of her marriages, her affairs with Howard Hughes, Tommy Manville, and Aristotle Onassis, and the regret she feels for neglecting her children in, in this memoir. Lake tells Bain in the book that her mother encouraged her to become an actress. Lake, reflecting on her career, was quoted by Bain as saying, unlike Anne Sheridan and Betty Grable, I am not a cheesecake master. My hair was all I needed. She mocked the label sex symbol and preferred the term sex zombie to describe herself. In 1969, while in the UK to promote her book, she was offered a role in the stage production of Madam Chairman. Lake also performed as Blanche Dubois in a 1969 English stage revival of A Streetcar Named Desire, for which she received acclaim. After splitting the profits from her autobiography with Bain, she used the money to co-produce and star in her last film, Flesh Feast, and Lake became increasingly paranoid as she grew older. She was living in Hollywood, Florida and had become reclusive. She told a friend that she believed the FBI was taping her phone. Lake didn't seem to be able to trust anyone near the end of her life, not even her own flesh. In a later interview, she said, I'm not going to cling to my blood and I'm not going to let them cling to me. I know what was done to me by my mother and I'm not going to do that, end quote. In June 1973, Lake came back to the United States from England where she had been promoting her autobiography. While she was traveling in Vermont, she went to a local doctor because she was having stomach pains. Due to her years of drinking, she was found to have cirrhosis of the liver. And on June 26, she went to University of Vermont Medical Center in Burlington. Doctors did not expect her to live long. She spent her final days signing autographs for nurses and actually seemed relatively optimistic during her final days. She died there on July 7th, 1973 of acute hepatitis and acute kidney injury. Her son Michael claimed her body. She was burned and her ashes were scattered off the coast of the Virgin Islands as she had asked. Not many people went to Lake's funeral. None of her four former husbands came to her funeral. Andre de Toth, her second husband, was very mean to her. Michael, Lake's son, asked de Toth for money so that Lake could be cremated. De Toth said no, that was her ex-husband, and he said a bunch of bad words in response. Michael had to get a loan to go to Vermont and get Lake's body. Her ashes stayed at the funeral home for two years before a friend, who was also Lake's ghostwriter, paid $200 to get them. For her contribution to the motion picture industry, Lake has a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. What a tragically sad ending. I want you guys to comment below your thoughts and what do you think about Hollywood and what do you think about this story? If you like the music you're listening to, the link is in the description. Like, subscribe, and comment below. Who else would you guys like to see a breakdown for? But I love you guys so much. Thank you for tuning in. Like, subscribe, share with a friend. Until next time.